Good morning and welcome to Moments with Melinda. I am your host, Melinda Moulton, and today I have as my guest, Chaz Eller. Hi, how are you, Chaz? Good. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for being on my show today. Um, let me tell my viewers a little bit about you. Chaz Eller has been in the recording industry for over 40 years. During that time, he has recorded or produced hundreds of LPs and CDs for numerous independent and major record labels. In the process, he has received three Indie Awards for his recording production work and has engineered two Grammy-nominated projects. Chaz is also a gifted keyboard mu musician. So thanks for being with me today. Can you, um, I wanna start by going back into your childhood and talking a little bit about where you hail from and your family and um, a little bit about how you got into music. Well, I got kind of moved around uh, a fair amount, only child. My dad was getting his um, PhD at the University of Oklahoma when I was born. So it was actually an Okie, uh, which always surprises people knowing my political bent. But uh, <laughs> so I, we moved from uh, Oklahoma when my dad got a job at the University of Iowa. And so we moved to Iowa City, Iowa when I was about two. When I was about three, I started messing around with our piano that, that was at our house. My parents were very musical. Um, and so my godmother, who was a classical violinist and one of the top um, female mountain climbers in the world, um, <laughs> she... Celia Ikai, she uh, she was in National Geographic a bunch of times for her climbing, but she was also an excellent classical uh, violinist. And she told my parents, you know, you should really get um, your son into piano lessons. And so I I started taking piano lessons when I was five, and uh, that took me through the whole era of Iowa, which ended at about sixth grade when we moved to Buffalo, New York for the U University of Buffalo. So. so what brought you to Vermont? College and skiing. I'm sorry to say not really in that order, but um, I came and looked at, I got accepted at four colleges and I came and looked at UVM first and just fell in love with it and uh, with the state actually. And um, yeah, never looked back. And is that, where you, got, um, is that where you got hooked up with most of your musician friends? Was it UVM? Um, not really. I, I hadn't um, really, I quit music in about seventh grade because at that time when we moved, moved to Buffalo, one of the things that my parents were interested in was getting me uh, a new piano teacher and a, you know, a better piano teacher than I had uh, access to in Iowa. And um, so I studied with this guy named Alan Giles, who was head of the uh, Baldwin International Piano Competition. And he, um, he took me on, he was a professor at the University of Buffalo. And so he took me on as a student. And unfortunately, I was, it was a mismatch because I really wasn't inclined to be a professional classical pianist. Um, I really, you know, interpreting written pre-existing music wasn't nearly as interesting as creating uh, uncharted territory uh, musically. And so I just, I would practice an hour and a half a day and he wanted me to practice a minimum of five to six hours a day. And I just kept falling behind. And one of his his other students was a gal named Claudia Hoka. And she was would fly to New York City like every other weekend and perform with the New York Philharmonic um, youth concerts with Leonard Bernstein. <laughs> and so that was where the bar was set. And I was like way below that in terms of my interest level and in, uh, pursuing that route. So it kind of was frustrating enough that I quit music in, in seventh grade and didn't really get back into it until college. And uh, 
And then after I got out of college, then I started meeting musical acquaintances so, that are still there. Today. So you play the classics. So so you must play by ear then as well. Yeah. 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 Actually, that is that's primarily why, why Alan Giles took me uh, as a student is he had two nine foot Steinway concert grands in his office. And uh, he would he sat at one and I sat at the other and he would just play like random chord clusters. And then I'd have to, you know, play it back uh, based on just listening because I couldn't see his hands. You know, That's what makes so, you a great, great, great composer. Do you still play the classics at all or or not? Often? Not really. I, I like Bach uh, for finger exercise, you know, dexterity right. and it's really like Bach is sort of like jazz, but it's on the beat instead of, you know, having swing to it. It's, uh, you know, the motion is very similar to jazz, I think. Right. So let's move into your career. You began Charles Eller Studios in 1985 in Burlington, and you eventually moved out to Charlotte and down to Mexico. Talk to us about that journey. Well, there's a big chapter right before that. And if you don't mind deviating to that, uh, yeah. I don't know. If... Please do. Please do. Okay. I started a group in co in college. I had a jazz group called uh, Citizens Band. And, and um, I quickly realized after, you know, getting out of school and working with these guys that you know, making $80 a week wasn't probably going to be a good enough uh, uh, income source to pursue music as a full-time avocation. So I uh, I ended up, I'm trying to think of the chronology here, but anyway, I, I ended up recording uh, my band with, I, I had always been interested in gear and my dad was sort of an audiophile and big music lover. And I, I inherited some of that from him, but uh, I made this recording and brought it into Philo records to see if I could, uh, I had been doing some work for them freelance um, as a um, doing music charts for copywriting music for folk musicians that weren't musically literate, you know, didn't know how to notate. And you needed to be able to do that at that point to uh, copyright your your songs. And so anyway, I went, I knew Bill Schubart a little bit and his half brother, Mike Couture. Michael. And uh, yeah. yeah, and I went to uh, Mike and said, you know, after I, you know, I worked with them a bit and dropped off the charts that I had handwritten for them and and uh, one day I took in this cassette recording of my band and Michael listened to it and said, like, you know, how did you do this? And I said, well, I just recorded it to a cassette machine. <laughs> and I set up a studio in my house in in uh, Starksboro and, you know, just recorded to uh, to this um, cassette machine. And so and I wanted to add some reverb with their reverb unit that was, you know, like a professional reverb unit just to, to kind of spruce it up. And Michael listened to it and said like, well, you know, you should, this is really good. This is, you know, you should really consider doing this for a living. And I was like, I had already kind of was looking for another way to express myself musically without starving to death. And so having two careers, seemed like a good idea, you know, that are both in music. Um, so anyway, the upshot is that I said, well, give me a job. And they said, well, we don't really have anything right now, but we would uh, be fine if you wanted to come and just hang out. And so I sold all my keyboards <laughs> to have enough money to live on, hoping that a job would become available at some point with them. And Bill and Mike uh, both, you know, just who I adore, um, you know, really did me a huge solid by by eventually finding a place for me in their uh, in their crew. And uh, I was there for eight years. And without that, you know, uh, 
introduction and without that uh, them behind me and and having guys in the industry that were already established, um, I wouldn't have been able to do it there. Well, that's beautiful. So hats off to Bill Schubart and Michael Couture um, for helping yeah. you get your start at your studio. So yeah. at, your, at your studio, I mean, you had some amazing people who frequently visited. You had Tanya Tucker, Stefan Max of Atlanta Records, Curtain Superstars, Mirabi Siba. I mean, you had some incredible people. Um, talk a little bit about setting up your own studio. First, it was in Burlington, and then you moved it out yeah. to Charlotte. But you eventually really um, brought a lot of incredible artists to Vermont to record up here. And then eventually, of course, you opened your recording studio down in Mexico. Talk a little bit about that journey. Well, back to Philo, because what happened is that um, in 1980, I believe, maybe 1979, Bill... I had started a group called Kilimanjaro with um, Paul Asbell and Tony Markellis, who uh, and those two guys I met pretty much. I knew Paul a bit, but Tony I met really at the studio, Philo Records studio, because he was on a lot of uh, various folk musicians' albums like Mary McCaslin and, and Utah Phillips, and and uh, he anyway so. Paul had written this material and said, I, you know, would you give it a listen and see what you think? And I was really impressed by it. And, and uh, we decided to start a group sort of informally on our off nights. And, uh, and it's got a buzz around town and, and Bill called me in and said, you know, Hey, what do we, what do you think we should do about this group Kilimanjaro? You know, he knew I was in the group, but <laughs> I was kind of wearing two hats because I was working for them and, you know, would have loved their backing, even though they were really known as a folk label and not jazz. So it ended up that um, we got signed to Philo and that was sort of the point where I realized like being on the road for three and a half months doing a U.S. tour and playing all these festivals around the world, you know, wasn't going to be very good for my job, uh, you know, security at Philo. And in fact, I then had to pretty much, uh, you know, part ways to focus on Kilimanjaro. And that's when I started my own studio in Burlington. So really it, it was all, congenial but um you know my my departure with philo and i still look back on it lovingly so um you know your pop jazz group kilimanjaro made it into the top five of the national jazz radio airplay charts in the 1980s and you also mm -hmm. played with the unknown blues band right yeah, yeah. Right. And, and you've right. got yeah and you've gone on tour with Paul Butterfield, Elizabeth Von Trapp, Esther Satterfield, Kane Dill, W.C. Clark, and Marva Wright, and many, many others. Um, so you've been out there as a performer, not just a recorder, mm -hmm. as a performer too. Right. Do, you, do you enjoy performing? You still perform. I saw you, I see you all the time pop up on stage with, you know, Bob Standard and Paul Asbell. So you're still performing. Yes. Yeah, for sure. And I always will, as, as long as I can physically do it i intend to do it because well, uh, you know it's artists well you're right you're a gifted keyboardist and you bring a lot to the lot to the stage so as a studio and location Thanks. recording engineer you've worked with dr john taj mahal bonnie Raitt, sean coleman Stuart copeland of the police doc watson the list again goes on and on and on what are some of your most notable memories of this time in your life no gosh, one of them there's Give so, me many, one. so many um most notable. Well, the Bonnie Brait thing was kind of cool because um, we I had been asked to produce the record for a small Vermont-based record label called Rebop Records, although they were distributed nationally and, and uh, you know, were kind of a main, a, a big player in the children's music uh, market. And... So I had been asked to um, do an album called Even Kids Get the Blues. And um, and it was blues, 
you know, authentic blues played with really great side men, a lot of my cohorts. And, uh, but it was this, there was a song on it that was written by this little girl named Annalise. And she, um, it's called, I want to be Bonnie. And so Tony, our bass player who played on the project knew Bonnie from Ann Arbor, Michigan days. And, uh, was and so Bonnie actually came to our a couple of our gigs over the years uh with Big Joe which was fun and uh one of which I was <laughs> was really surreal because I was talking to her she came on Halloween she had played at the Flynn and then came down to Hunt's and I and we were in I was in drag completely for my Halloween costumes <laughs> and I was carrying on a conversation and she kept going, Oh man, I keep thinking I'm talking to a chick, you know? <laughs> so anyway, but, uh, but anyway, she, so we sent her this, that song, I want to be Bonnie. And it, she just loved it. You know, she said, people send me stuff from their kids all the time, but like, this is the first time that somebody has really sent something that's meaningful to me. And, you know, she, so I had a nice conversation with her on the phone and then she, I wanted her in the lyrics. Um, there's this little girl is singing how she wants to be Bonnie. And incidentally, she's like a redhead. And I mean, she's really like, looks like she could be Bonnie's daughter. But um, she says in the, in the song, the lyrics says, and maybe someday, a phone call I'll get saying, quote, hi, this is Bonnie. Want to sing a duet? And so and so I since it was a phone call, I thought, OK, well, I'll rec I'll record Bonnie saying that. So we had this phone patch set up and and uh, I got to talk to her for 15 minutes or so. And she, you know, she said, like, I want to be part of this girl's life. You know, I can't promise that I can put her through college, but, you know, I mean, she was just. So she put that album on her website for three months uh, on the, t the homepage of her website, promoting it for us, which was really cool. I love it. She's a sweetheart. Uh, so that, so, and she keeps coming back to Vermont, which is so great. So there, yep. I, there is a great YouTube video where you're talking about meeting big Joe Burrell. And this was when you first got thrown into playing the blues uh, and it's a great story. Could you share very, you know, briefly how you got into playing the blues and moving from pop jazz to blues? Well, you know, um, I'm not even sure what that YouTube video is, but I would. I'll, I send, do you the link. I'll send you the link. It's two and a half minutes and you're, it's very oh, funny. It's funny. Interesting. Yeah. So I, uh, my bandmates in Kilimanjaro, Paul Asbell, who I saw that you have done interview with and, uh, and Tony Markellis, who left us, unfortunately, two years ago when he passed on and um, and uh, those two guys in particular had a blues background. Paul had an enormous blues background um, playing, you know, Muddy Waters and Howlin' Wolf and he's on the Fathers and Sons record and people should go to his interview with you and uh, get all the, all the facts. But um, he, and Tony and a fellow named uh, Martin Grosswent, who was a philo artist, had started this group um, called the Unknown Blues Band. And they started it before we met Big Joe. And so they invited me to come down and join. And I had never played blues really, but you know, it was e you know, it was easy for me. I knew what it was supposed to sound like. And uh, they had an old upright piano at Hunt's. And so I went down and, you know, joined them. And I think on the second or third gig that I did with the band, um, Paul had met Big Joe at a uh, musician's union party, Christmas party, and invited him to come down. And as soon as Joe joined us, it was like, like, this is it. We're, we're doing this other band uh, and so it was, you know, the unknown blues band featuring big Joe Burrell. And, uh, and it was great because we would go away for six months, sometimes or three months, three and a half months, usually for a tour, but we do two tours for, in, I think in 84 and 85, we did two tours in one 
year. So we were out for about six months and we would go away and play kil- exclusively pil- Kilimanjaro material, uh, doing one nighters at various clubs around the country and, and festivals. And then we'd come back after we got sort of burned out on playing the same music for three and a half months every night, we'd come back and totally change our, put different hats on and play this really fun, danceable blues. Uh, and it was fun, you know, that that juxtaposition of the two bands was great because it was always kind of kept each band fresh for us. And uh, so, you were, so, so you are a member of the Vermont Blues Society and I want to send folks to the website. It's www.vermontbluesociety.org. Um, it's a great group of uh, musicians from from the state. So you also do live concert engineering work, which has taken you to some of the top concert halls in the world, such as Carnegie Hall, Metropolitan Opera House, Avery Fisher Hall, Lincoln, Lincoln Center, and Tanglewood, to just name a few. Um, so I thought that was pretty cool that you've also done engineering at some of these incredible um, venues. But um, as we're kind of running out of time here, I understand that the Lane Gibson um, uh, is now, has taken over your studio, but you're still there. Mm -hmm. And um, so I wanted people to know that that website is lanegibson.com. If you're looking for any engineering work, you're still a part of that group. Um, So I want to talk to you a little bit about your collaboration with Spencer Lewis. The Lewis and Eller Mm -hmm. duo. Talk to me a little bit about that. Well, way back, and I don't know how many years, but I'm guessing 20 years ago, uh, Spencer came into the studio and had me put keyboard parts on some of his music. And uh, it, it was a really fun collaboration and popular you know the i you know he sold a lot of cds he he had his own uh, distribution system where he had these cd you know racks of cds in various stores around the state and um around new england i believe but anyway so we've always just kind of you know he'll every couple years he'll give me a call and say hey i got a couple new songs i'd like you to play on and and Last year, we actually did several gigs together, which was fun. Um, because and we did, I think, 15 years ago, we did uh, the Flynn Space, he, we did a show there, but uh, yeah, it's just it's kind of a reoccurring. So, how do, um, how do people music. find out about where you're playing? I mean, do you have any a site that people can go to so they can become well, a- my face, you know, really for Facebook is for me is primarily <laughs> useful. Good. Well, then I'm going to encourage to my viewers to become followers of Chaz Eller on Facebook, um, because I think we'd all love to to come and hear you and be a part of your music scene. So what are you working uh, on right now? What's, what's your current um, project? I'm currently producing a project for um, Leon, Leon, Leroy Preston, uh, who is the co-founder of Asleep at the Wheel, um, the Texas swing band from Austin, and I think they're based out of Austin. And Leroy's a great songwriter. He um, he wrote a song that became a hit for Roseanne Cash, and followed that up with another song that that she did. And uh, he co-wrote a song for uh, Katie Lang. And um, you know he's written stuff for Asleep at the Wheel. And so anyway, he's got. 10 songs that um, I've been, I brought in basically my current band with Paul Asbell, Jeff Salisbury, and Clyde Stats as a rhythm section. And we are backing up Leroy in the studio in Charlotte and uh, having a lot of fun doing it. Outstanding. He's, he's great. Outstanding. Well, you have to let us know when that album comes out. Um, so, yeah. so, Chaz, what do you make of today's music and who are some of your favorite musical artists of today? Boy, that's a good question. Um, Jacob Collier gets my attention. Um, he's he's pretty brilliant. And um, um, I'm just blanking out now. And, that's okay. Oh, Corey, Corey Henry uh, as a keyboard player is is really in, inspiring to me. Actually, Jacob Collier is a great, 
great keyboard player too, but he does, he's a multi-instrumentalist and great yes. singer. And There's some amazing musicians with the Vermont Blues Society. I got to tell you, man. I mean, and the music in Vermont. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of local talent. There really is. Our... So I wanted to ask you, um, because this has been on my mind lately, do you believe that our music scene is engaged in the issues of our time the way we were back in the 60s and 70s? Mm, no, I don't think so. But I mean, I don't know that. Are you talking about the blues? Well, the no, I'm talking music... about during our during our 60s revolution. I mean, you're part of that era. We oh, had, but not had... not just locally, but I mean, oh no, no, global... I'm talking about globally. I mean, we had, you know, the Farm Aid. We had all these different, you know, uh, groups coming together to. Plus, the music was was so instrumental and no pun intended in helping us to to think through the the are the time that we were living in and i'm just not feel I, i'm just asking you how you feel because i would like to see more music being written that sort of focuses on our time and i was just wondering yeah well i don't know if you have you seen that there's a i think it's a netflix uh show that's the it's called the greatest night in pop music yes. It's about the making of We Are the World. Yes. It is so, so good. It is so <laughs> I good. I mean, we all know the story, but when you see that, the video that they made out of it, it's really incredible. And it does make you think back like, mm, yeah, this people, like, here, here's like every star in the world practically at this thing. Well, and they're we had, all donating their time and, you know. And we, and we, had, we had Joan Baez, we had Bob Dylan, we had Crosby, Stills and Nash. We, I mean, the musicians wrote, um, I mean, well, Woodstock, you know, all the music from Woodstock. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. But I do encourage our young people, you know, to write songs about our time. I think it's really important. Yeah. So, there have been some amazing success stories just recently uh, here in Vermont. Um, let me get us to the gallery here. Um, and he's Mitchell for her Tony Award winning musical, Hades Town, and Shana Taub for Shuffs now on Broadway. I mean, these two women. Yeah. I've hit Broadway and boom, you know, Tony know. is here. I boom. Know. I mean, the, the, some of the young musicians and women musicians here in Vermont are extraordinary. Um, yeah. So we're coming to the end of our, our, our interview here. I wanted to ask you um, as a wise old music man, indomitable music man, if you could give us some perspective on our world today, our democracy and the realities of climate change, um, do you hold hope for our species future? Uh, yeah, I'm always an optimist, but I am also pretty concerned about a lot of what's going on right now. And of course, that it's that could be a whole show in itself. But uh, <laughs> but I ask this know. question of all my of all my interviewees. Yeah. At the end, I always say, "So, what's your?" And and I get this wide range of where people are coming from on this. And I just, from a musician's perspective and somebody from the, I assume you're a, you're a 60s, 60s, 70s child, right? Yeah. 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 That what, you know, what is your, what is your wisdom for the viewers of my show coming from Chaz Eller? <laughs> well, I've been, um, you know, kind of looking over my shoulder at retirement and, um, you know, from certain aspects of my career. And I would really like to, you know, think that I could transfer some of that energy into, um, you know, doing more, getting more involved, you know, in some of the political uh, things that are, that badly need attention or attention. Well, I'm going to hold you to that. And rather than, than using the word retirement, I would call it repurposing. Because you'll always, yeah, play, thanks. you'll always play music. You'll always be yeah. called upon to, to participate. Um, but yeah, I think um, I can't believe that we're sort of fighting the same fights that we fought, you know, fifty years ago. Yeah. Well, I hope we're winning at it. Yeah. At so, so what's what's on for the rest of your day, Mister Eller? Um. 
Well, just uh, getting ready to go back in and do some keyboard parts with uh, Leroy Preston, who I was telling you about. And um, yeah, just it's it seems like I, I kind of jokingly are talking about uh, retirement because I really never am going to quit doing either the engineering or the um, keyboards that I do. But I also have my a lot of my stuff set up in the basement of my house here in Waltham, Vermont. And um, I, um, you know, enjoy playing on people's projects. They send me the tracks. It can all be done remotely. And I've got 31 keyboards or something that I can, you know, put on just about any sound that people want. And, uh, you know, enjoy learning the different styles and, and uh, that they require well i believe that you'll always be making music i don't think we ever stop making music um and right. you're not going anywhere and you will be busy for the rest of your life and now you'll be cho you maybe choosing things that you want to do rather than things that you have to do which is always wonderful so thank you yeah. for your time i i've known you for so so, you, so many me. years and i'm so honored and pleasured that you uh, joined me today and I got to learn and my viewers got to learn a little bit more about you, Chaz. Thank you for that. Well, thank you. And to my viewers, I want to thank you for joining us today and I will see you soon. Have a beautiful day. Bye-bye.